10 years ago, From Software released an unusual game called Demon's Souls. Actually, the game itself wasn't that unusual in the context of the whole gaming history. It was unusual for its time. It was the next step of what they once did with Kingsfield and its latest iteration Kingsfield 4. And even Kingsfield 1 on the first PlayStation, which was also From Software's first game, resembles old RPG pioneers like Withertree and the first full 3D first person RPG Ultima Underworld The Stygian Abyss, which I've already talked about in my video about stamina systems in more detail. So Demon Souls and then Dark Souls are nothing really new in their core. Of course, they had some interesting new ideas too. However, their core gameplay was part of a path of iterations and developments over the course of 20 to 30 years of gaming history. After a troubled development, Demon's Souls was initially not that well received in Japan and Sony decided to not release it in the West. However, for people who imported it, it became a hidden gem. It seemed really fresh and was received well in the West, turning it into an insider tip under core gamers. Seeing the demand for it outside of Japan, Sony decided to also publish it for the Western market. Still a niche title back then, its successes developed a lot of popularity, becoming something like a synonym for difficulty and now 10 years later From Software has reached the first gate of a AAA studio you could say, a success story. But what made Demon's Souls so unusual for its time when its game concepts weren't really new? In the years around 2009, core gamers complained a lot about games becoming more and more casual. For example, the Nintendo Wii opened the door for a whole new audience of gamers who weren't into games before and was highly successful with it. But those gamers were not the classical core gamers that played Ninja Gaiden or Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles on the NES, almost destroying their controller in their wrath. I still get angry if I just think about that stupid underwater demo level. Nintendo implemented things like the Super Guide in New Super Mario Bros. Wii, where the game basically plays itself to the end of the level if you are stuck. In this time, every game needed extensive tutorials and help mechanics, as if players weren't able to tie their own shoes. If I think about it, I played Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles when I wasn't able to tie up my own shoes, but you know what I mean. But then came Demon's Souls, like an ancient entity from another world, a game that was not afraid to scare off the player. It looked like a modern game and played well and responsive, but it didn't tell you anything. No extensive tutorials, it had a giant stat screen and you had no clue what they do. You had to find it out for yourself. And the game was hard. If difficulty is the probability of encountering an explicit or implied state of failure, Demon's Souls, later the Dark Souls games and Bloodborne can be considered difficult. And it also had a very unusual concept of safe games and checkpoints. In modern games of that time, it became popular to have many automatically generated saves, the checkpoints. So you never can get stuck and never have to replay too much on failure. Well, Demon's Souls saved pretty much all the time, but it added consequences to death. You would lose all your souls, basically gold and experience points, you hadn't spent on death. And you could only, or mainly, spend souls at certain safe locations, like the hub world. Inside a level, you had to decide. Spending your souls and fighting again through the level because all enemies would respawn when you left or rested or continue exploring with the risk of losing them. However, if you lost them, you had one chance to retrieve them if you managed to get back to the place where you died last. If you died again before getting them back, they were gone and you lost a part of your progression. A brutal punishment for failure that was not existent in many other games of that time. And somehow this hit a nerve. Finally, players were taken seriously again. Finally, a game offered a challenge, combined with a great learning curve, well-designed levels, a unique atmosphere and mysterious lore. Finally, you could rage again, almost destroying your controller on failure or feel like a carnation of skill on success. When fighting a difficult boss, your heart was beating fast. Failure could be frustrating at times, but at the same time, many players continued and tried again and again until they overcame the challenge. 
Demon's Souls and Dark Souls reminded the gaming industry that failure and challenge is a big part of what defines a game and that there is a demand for it. With this it changed the gaming landscape of the last decade and Souls-like even became some kind of subgenre. Now about 10 years after Demon's Souls release, From Software released their newest work, Sekiro Shadows Die Twice. It's one of their few games that does not have the word Souls in its name. But is it a Souls game? Yes and no. 10 years of making Souls games including Bloodborne leaves its mark on you and you see it with Sekiro. There are many parts in it that feel like a Souls game. Sound effects, level and world design, animations, UI, game design and so on. It really is a game by the makers of Dark Souls. However, some parts also feel different. It has lost almost all classical RPG elements and is in that regard almost like a spectacle fighter with a more grounded spectacle compared to games like Bayonetta. From Software once made a game called Tenchu and Sekiro has many similarities to it too. I personally would say it's a mixture of a lot of genres and FromSoft games. Sekiro plays in a fictional and mystic Japan where you play as a wolf also called Sekiro which I think would be translated with one of a pair wolf or one armed wolf according to an interview. A shinobi who lost his arm got a mystical prosthetic arm as replacement and is bound to an iron coat to rescue his master and bring him back at any cost. His prosthetic arm takes over the role of weapon variety and gives Sekiro a grappling hook that allows levels to be a bit more vertical. He also has a jump and a wall jump that is an essential part of the gameplay. What the game does well, especially with the grappling hook, is exploration which is again a lot of fun. The game is not that linear comparable to for example some of the later Souls games. You can always find something in the areas, even different approaches to get through the levels. Stealth plays a big role as in Tenshu. A part of exploring that felt a bit problematic though are definitely rewards for exploration. While for example Dark Souls set the bar for rewards and exploring insanely high, Sekiro struggles a bit here. Too many times you find ceramic shards, so basically a stone that you can throw at enemies healing pellets or other consumable items which are useful but can be bought or farmed early on. Not that spectacular and rewarding in my opinion. Don't get me wrong, sometimes you find amazing things after exploring in Sekiro 2 but sometimes you don't and it was at least something that caught my attention. We come to that again in a moment. The presentation in Sekiro including art direction, animation, cutscenes, atmosphere, how enemies and bosses are introduced and how the game feels is on an extremely high level as we are used to from previous FromSoft games. A beautiful looking game with a beautiful world that plays well. It also runs well at least on PC. I heard the Xbox One version has some problems though. PlayStation 4 should be fine too but I have no personal experience with the console versions. I only had some frame pacing issues and micro stutters in one area quite late in the game in the Fountainhead Palace on my PC but that was the exception. Overall Sekiro is an amazing game but it's not perfect and I actually didn't like it that much and felt quite disappointed after completing the game. And here we finally come to a very subjective but important part. Critiques and reviews are always subjective but here's a thing that feels even more subjective because I totally understand why so many people like it. The combat. Sekiro continues the trend of the later From Software games to focus more on relentless combat and sacrifices a lot for it. Bloodborne already did this, Dark Souls 3 did it but Sekiro sacrifices the most which is fair because it wants to be a somewhat different game or let's say a similar game with a partially different combat system. While in previous Souls games your goal was to reduce the enemies usually not regenerating health to zero without dying, in Sekiro they changed this concept a bit and split health into two components, health and posture. The actual health points have two functions, reducing them to zero still kills the enemy but lowering them also reduces posture regeneration. The posture bar is basically an inverted health bar with regeneration that is also tied to a different mechanic than just damage. If you can fill it up completely you get a death blow which reduces the enemy's health to zero instantly no matter how much health is left. 
but some special enemies have multiple health bars, usually, as the title suggests, two. Same with the protagonist, he can also revive one time. For completeness sake, under certain circumstances, even more than once, but you get the point. So the idea of the game is that you build up the posture bar of your enemy and kill him with a cool looking finisher. The actual health bar is not that important. You do this through four things, damaging your enemy's actual health bar, forcing your enemy to block your attacks, you parrying enemy attacks in Sekiro called deflecting and certain counters and special moves. In contrast, the damage of your sword attacks on the actual health bar is often really poor, at least against stronger enemies. Killing a mini boss or boss enemy by just raw damage to his hit points takes forever. It feels a bit like your sword is made out of plastic, but if you get hit, you are dead in 2 to 3 hits every time. So what you do instead is filling up that posture bar as fast as you can and here the game turns its back to the more strategic approach common in the Souls games and transforms into basically a rhythm game. Now if you like the core concept of rhythm games, you will probably love Sekiro's combat once you find out about this, but when you don't like the core concept of rhythm games, probably you don't like Sekiro's combat as much. Sadly, I'm one of the latter. I thought a lot about what it is that I don't like about its fighting mechanics, but like more in the combat system of the Souls games. In Souls I also learn patterns, like in a rhythm game, but what's the exact difference? And now we come back to what I said earlier, sacrifices. The differences are options, choices and strategy. Souls games manage to induce the illusion of choice in combat. It has probably in many occasions an optimal way of playing too, which can be very similar, but it's not as determined as it is in Shadows Die Twice. Sekiro says deflect, attack, jump and maybe dodge sometimes. In some cases you can jump instead of dodging or dodge instead of jumping, but deflecting is in most cases king. Sekiro has a very clear vision of how it wants to be played and it also tells you about it all the time. We come to this at the end of the video. If an enemy in Dark Souls does a thrust attack with a high recovery time, I have a ton of options. Block with for example a shield and attack, parry if possible and attack, dodge to the side and attack, I frame the attack by dodging into it and attack so I get more time for it, walk to the side in advance if the attack has bad tracking and attack, move or dodge back and range attack or cast a spell, dodge and do nothing or wreck stamina or health and tank the attack and trade damage. And I have the choice. Some aren't optimal, some are better than others most of the time, but they are there and they work. Interestingly, you also have almost all those options in Sekiro, but what you want to do and the game tells you to do, Mikiri counter, attack and if possible deflect like a maniac. The counter option is somewhat new though, but let's develop this thought even further and pretend all options available work equally well in Sekiro. What's the difference then? The follow up. And this is huge in my opinion. All the options I listed lead to somewhat meaningful decisions in Souls games. You can argue it's an illusion of choice, but it's a good one. What you do and what you decide has consequences, it has impact. If I manage to avoid the thrust by walking to the side, I lose no stamina dodging and I lose almost no time dodging. I can instantly attack and have time to attack multiple times before the enemy recovers and I need to dodge again. If I roll to the side first, I lose 30% of my stamina for the roll. This has impact on my following options. As explained in my stamina video, having no stamina means you have almost no options in Souls. In Dark Souls 2 you can't even use an item without stamina, you can just walk, that's all you have. So you have to take this into account for your next step if you are already missing 30% of your stamina. So I could attack twice with a normal attack and have no stamina left or I could attack once with a heavy attack and a tiny bit of stamina left, allowing me to avoid the follow up of the enemy by for example rolling or blocking. Even the direction I roll to is often an important choice. These are impactful decisions. Let's say the enemy has one response or follow up where I can get away with attacking twice normally and one where I don't. I can take a bet. In a worst case scenario I have to heal, but my progress, the damage to the health bar is not lost and I just traded damage for an heal item. 
nobody except death can take the damage I dealt away from me, at least if the enemy can't heal himself, which is rarely the case for boss fights and if a boss can heal there's usually counterplay. In Sekiro I often can take a bet like this because the damage itself is not that impactful and if I have to recover or trade damage for a heal item the posture of my enemy recovers again during this time especially at the start of a fight where his health is still high. This circumstance makes the beginning of fights really repetitive for me. Of course this repetitiveness resolves a bit the longer the fight takes because lower HP significantly reduces the posture regeneration. In addition you can revive one time in Sekiro, however you die so fast and are revived with only half HP that this doesn't change too much when you haven't fully learned the rhythm yet. It's just a tool for error correction when you mess up the rhythm game one or two times. But that's not all, in Souls you could specifically equip for a boss too. So if I know I will often use the heavy attack and attacking two or three times in a row is really rare even with a fast weapon, I could use a weapon with high damage on the heavy attack. In Dark Souls 3 I could also even consider weapon arts on Bloodborne, the transformation component of the trick weapons. I know changing your weapon is not happening that often to be honest but the option is there. That's what I mean with illusion of choice. When I made the Fume Knight guide for Dark Souls 2 I learned to beat this boss fists only. I could beat him with no damage taken. I knew everything about his attacks and practice him like 20 hours. I knew that if I roll into his attack and use the roll attack of my weapon instead the normal one he had no way of punishing me here before I was able to roll again. While if I would have used a different and slower weapon this was not possible. There are understanding, knowledge, impactful decisions and consequences, options, strategy, reactions and build options on top of that. This is different in Sekiro. The options are very often quite limited or let's say the game is designed to be played in a certain way. The element that breaks a bit out of this are the prosthetic tools and they are bound to a collectible resource. At the end of the game I also didn't use them too much in fights because sometimes they were so powerful that they felt like exploiting. You can literally stun lock boss enemies with them. It's an option too but not that fun for me. I just spam the tool and can hit the enemy for free. In contrast others felt almost useless. In addition there are combat arts in Sekiro 2. I can decide to use them to for example punish certain attacks but often it did not feel very impactful. The damage differences are minor and enemies are designed in a way that they also usually start deflecting again after being hit by a combat art or two normal hits. No matter how optimal you play and time your punish. Many combat arts also didn't feel very useful or very situational except for like three or four of them. However to actually beat most tough enemies in Sekiro fast I had to learn the deflect patterns or rhythms and recognize the Mikiri counter attacks early and then the game becomes almost trivial especially if you in addition exploit weaknesses by using the prosthetic tools. But is this bad? No. It's just different and it's not my cup of tea. I tend to find a lot of battles repetitive, a bit boring and sometimes also a bit frustrating. I was rarely thinking I have to change my strategy. Instead I thought I have to play the rhythm game part better and learn the patterns. There is of course also a bit of tweaking your movement and finding a way to deal with certain special attacks left in the game but it seemed not to be the main focus of the combat system anymore. However that's just me, I'm missing something. What the game does is by no means bad, it's a good game. Many people enjoy and praise how fast paced and fluent the combat can feel and how rewarding this relatively difficult game can be if you finally manage to learn the rhythm of a tough enemy and suddenly beat him perfectly. It's in the game and the reviews reflect that. I for my part do not enjoy the combat too much, I'm missing options and if we compare it to spectacle fighters it also lacks interesting combat choices and combos. It feels too often like all I do is spamming deflect or attack and react to certain special attacks like to quick time events. 
For the final part, I want to look at several elements of the game that are at least a bit less subjective. The story and world. While everything looks nice and well done, the world and story in their core didn't blow me away. Souls games often offer places and enemies I have not seen before, or let's say have rarely seen before. Some places truly felt unique and special in context of the gaming cosmos. My jar was on the floor when I first entered Ash Lake in Dark Souls 1. Except for maybe one or two areas, everything in Sekiro feels like I've seen it before many times. Maybe because I like trashy martial arts movies from Asia or the previous game spoiled me a bit. Still, the enemy variety in Sekiro is lacking in comparison. It doesn't stand out enough to be devastating for the game though, but compared to what the previous games offered, it was noticeable. Then many motives and ideas of the story I have often seen in movies and games already. A man devoted to a tedious task to cleanse his mind reminds me a bit of for example spring, summer, fall, winter and spring. Phenomenal movie by the way. This motive is is present in a lot of martial arts movies. Of course, I understand that this is related to Buddhism and fits the setting of Sekiro perfectly. It's less the why it's there, more the it's there and I have already seen it a lot, where in contrast this feeling was less present in Dark Souls and Bloodborne, even though they have clear inspirations too, like Berserk or the works of H.P. Lovecraft. However, I found it far more noticeable in Sekiro. A woman throwing kunai and using almost invisible strings, I've seen that before too. Flying swords of Dragon Gate comes to my mind. A samurai who can't die reminds me of Blade of the Immortal. A protagonist who is called Wolf or Okami and has to look after a boy, Lone Wolf and Cup Anyone, also an amazing series. The high pressure blood sprays. According to the legend, its origin is from an accident while Akira Kurosawa filmed Sanjuro, a pump that should spray out a bit of blood in a scene accidentally pumped it out at full force, almost knocking over the actor. They could not shoot this scene again and so the scene made it into the film, which was released 1962 and from there it developed into a stylistic device. I heard there's a reference to the Kabuki theater too. It also reduces the violence aspect a bit because it has this unrealistic component to it while in addition being stylized. And these are just a few examples. I know the Berserk fans will cry out loud now because Dark Souls borrows a lot from the series too, but it's very specific to the series and Dark Souls still has unique places in addition, while most elements in Sekiro feel more familiar and known throughout tropes of a whole genre. To exaggerate my point a bit, Berserk in Dark Souls versus every martial arts and samurai slash ninja film ever in Sekiro. Still, this is just a minor point of criticism that is noticeable in contrast and may be quite specific to my person, but you can't deny that most places in Sekiro simply don't feel that special. It also doesn't help that they reuse the same area three times. If we come back to the gameplay again, I also noticed some minor things. The game has again status effects and one that kills you instantly called Terra in Sekiro. Those were present in the Soul series too, for example the infamous curse status that beyond killing you instantly also halved your HP after respawning at the bonfire as long as you don't cure the curse. However, the game offered more counterplay options and only one boss in the first Dark Souls used it to some extent and it was more a thing of certain areas in the game used by one specific enemy. In Sekiro multiple bosses and mini bosses use Terra, which in my opinion adds nothing to the game. You have counterplay in the form of an item called pacifying agent or even a special guard. Both reduce the Terra bar to zero and grant additional Terra resistance for 30 seconds, but that's it. In Souls you had a consumable item too. You could equip a curse resistance ring and even some armor parts had built in curse resistance. In addition you could carry soft humanity, so the stat, which would also increase the resistance by quite a bit. Sekiro keeps the instant kill character of it, but a little bit neglects options to deal with it. It's still an annoying mechanic that probably nobody would miss if it wasn't there. 
but it's also not that bad. I would suggest a new status effect that maybe makes you slower for some time or something like this instead of an instant death mechanic. As mentioned in the combat system section, it would feel in my opinion better if instead of using the collectible spirit emblems for prosthetic tool users, you would have something like a mana bar for it that is also easier to recharge or slowly regenerates all the time, maybe tied to a skill so you don't have to rest or later trade health for them while fighting or exploring. I think the shinobi tools make the game more interesting and it could be more generous here. Getting Spirit emblems is of course not the problem, but the mount you carry is quite limited and updating this by using skill points does not feel very rewarding because you only get one additional emblem per skill. I expected something like 3 or even 5, but you only get one. Also I think it's stupid that they get more expensive over time when you buy them at an idol. They are so easy to farm, but in contrast get quite expensive fast at the idol. Speaking of prosthetic tools, some of them are very powerful and useful, while others feel very underwhelming and almost useless and I found myself using them less and less in my playthrough. Especially some allow you to stunlock enemies and feel almost broken like an exploit, while others are extremely situational. I never wanted to abuse them, so I used them less instead. A better balance could have created more variety in my opinion. Another topic I want to address is a bit of a felt inconsistency here and there. I wouldn't even go as far as call the game as a whole inconsistent, except for a few cases maybe. It's more unexpected, which is probably the better word. One enemy can consistently shoot you through a solid rock or part of the terrain with his magic attack, but that's quite unexpected by the player, when what you expect from attacks clashes with what actually happens in the game it feels inconsistent, even though the interaction is in fact consistent, if you know what I mean. I experienced some strange interactions from time to time where I didn't understand why I got hit, didn't dodge, deflect or block an attack or even the other way around, why I was not hit by an attack when it clearly went through my character. The hitboxes feel sometimes very precise but also sometimes very wonky in contrast. The classic example in Souls would be grab attacks and they are strange in Sekiro too. The game even tells you to dodge grab attacks using the dodge button. However, jumping up is far more consistent to avoid grab attacks even if they clearly hit you, which feels again quite unexpected. I also like the grappling hook a lot, but sometimes it does not work that well. Jumping and grabbing a ledge felt very unintuitive for me and the animation can look weird at times too. You have to press the grab button very early and then you sometimes are pulled to the ledge as if it's magnetic. As mentioned, the game tells you about its mechanics. I explained at the beginning of the video that Demon Souls didn't tell you anything and you had to find out its mechanics yourself, working through hints in item and update descriptions, hoping you could make any sense out of it. Dark Souls didn't change this too much and this felt refreshing in a time of over tutorialized games. Finding out mechanics felt as part of exploring the world and story. Of course, some parts should have been more clear, like upgrading weapons in Dark Souls was so cryptic and complicated that it's almost impossible to find it out yourself for certain upgrade paths. But Sekiro breaks with this from software tradition and explains you everything. When you start the game every 10 meters you get a new text box explaining you new mechanics of the game, to a point where I would call it annoying. I would say that the game is not that complicated, that it needs so many text boxes, especially text boxes popping up in the middle of a fight, pausing the game and kicking you out of your flow. Not a fan of that. In addition, the amount of hints is confusing and some of them are even leading you into a wrong direction, like recommending to dodge grab attacks, which works well on some enemies, but not so well on others. Jumping is always a far safer option from my perspective. 
Then we have the stealth system, which is hard to pronounce for me. It is often fun and offers nice options if the game allows it. Sometimes the game seems not to allow stealth kills and it always feels a bit strange. Enemies also don't react to dead bodies on the floor, which makes sense game design wise because you don't have to bother with implementing a carrying bodies around mechanic, but it often feels like enemies are insanely stupid. What is strange design wise however is stealth in the context of failure, in the sense of you die. If you choose to sneak through the level, stealth kill your way to the mini boss and die, you have to slowly sneak again because the level resets and all enemies are back again. At this point sneaking becomes a waste of time. You just try to find ways to get to the mini boss as fast as possible to repeat the fight over and over. In situations like these it becomes clear that it's a mechanic that is somewhat just tacked on. It's not the main game mechanic and at some point only there to just quick kill an annoying enemy or take a health bar away from a mini boss. Stealthing is also incredibly easy and a big contrast to the difficulty of the rest of the game. It never bothered me in the game but thinking about it it's a quite unnecessary mechanic. Dark Souls had a small stealth element like this too where you can walk slowly behind an enemy and backstab him to make things easier. If you really want to use stealth in Sekiro you have to hide and wait which is actually boring and often feels like a waste of time. You could argue that it makes some areas less annoying but how about making them more fun in the first place. I often ended up running through, which you also do in the Souls games at times, but with a grappling hook and the extended mobility it's quite easy in Sekiro. In addition skills and money are not that impactful, so I don't even miss too much doing so. This in my opinion clashes heavily with a stealth system which seems to be just there to avoid too much fighting on your first few visits of a new area. Also if you stealth too much you are not well prepared for fights where stealth suddenly stops existing because the game says so and you end up in a 1v1 combat if you want it or not. And on top of that there are mostly bosses and you can't progress further without beating them. I know there is at least one boss which can be stealth killed but this is clearly unintended. This strategy or trick is used by some speedrunners in a certain category. Still stealth is just removed from the game in those fights by the power of cutscenes and it always feels like a second thought to the game through this. Speaking of combat, animations especially for the 3 plus 1 special attack types swipe, thrust, grab and one I won't spoil here are sometimes hard to read. The stress is on sometimes. It's totally possible to recognize almost all attacks with no problems but I think moves were telegraphed a bit better in the Soul series. The game informs you about an incoming special attack even with a sound and a symbol above the enemy's head but recognizing what attack it is in this short time frame takes longer than it should. Maybe it's because of the big red indicator. Especially when some of them almost one shot you it can be frustrating. However nothing that can be solved with a bit of practice but it took me longer than usual or it's just me getting old. This game also has the from software typical camera problems. It's not game breaking but still not great. To intensify this they also like to put big enemies or enemies with high range into far too small rooms so that the camera becomes the true enemy of the fight. Never understood that but I remember some infuriating areas. Also there is this fascinating phenomenon that even if the area is quite big you often end up fighting the boss close to a wall. In one boss arena they also carefully placed some branches to block your view at times. No idea why FromSoft does this though. The music of Sekiro seems to be received quite mixed. A reason for that might be that Sekiro uses music more ambient while in the mostly musicless Souls games it was always a really special moment when the music kicked in, usually in boss fights. It was also epic and powerful and more in the foreground. In Souls music was a star, in Sekiro it's more like an extra. 
Extras are important too to generate a certain atmosphere and enriching a scene by making it more alive. I feel that's often the case in Sekiro too. It's less in your face and more in the background. So just a different approach. The quality is still great. It might also be that Asian tunes are overused for some people. Samurai and shinobi films, including anime, were always popular in the West. As I explained earlier, Sekiro's story and places often feel like I've seen them before. Same with the music, I guess. Still, some people really like it and I think the soundtrack has some fantastic tracks too. It's not a quality issue. The last point is another consequence from the sacrifices Sekiro makes. Replayability. I think in comparison with Souls games, Sekiro does not offer enough for multiple playthroughs. It's maybe worth finding some of the optional bosses and one ending also alters the last two bosses of the game a bit. But beyond that, there's not much reason. The lack of build variety simply makes it less interesting. Playing different routes does not feel that impactful in Sekiro, where in Dark Souls 1 and 2, alternative routes also allow different play styles due to the great item placement and finding items early in those games was highly impactful. Dark Souls 2 even offered the option to find different items in NG Plus and NG Plus 2 and it changed even some of the boss fights a little bit. In addition, they offered co-op and PvP multiplayer, which at least was for me a reason to invest countless hours into those games. But I think it's great too that Sekiro focuses on single player only. Overall, Sekiro is again a great game by From Software. Me not liking the combat system, however, is a huge minus for me personally. The weaker replayability will also prevent me from revisiting the game as often as previous Souls games. However, these points are not that important for my conclusion, especially the first one, because it's related to personal taste. If you like the style of Sekiro's combat and like playing something that is distantly related to a rhythm game and don't fear difficulty, then Sekiro could be for you and I would recommend it. I also think if you disliked the Souls games before, Sekiro could be more interesting for you too, even though some parts are also quite similar and it's still a difficult game. You die in two or three hits most of the time and some attacks and combos can even one-shot you. It feels a bit like a level 1 run in Dark Souls, just with almost infinite stamina to compensate a bit. One or two mistakes in a row and you are dead. However, the so important parry or deflect as it's called here is far more generous than in previous titles. You can even cancel attacks into a deflect and spamming the block button during enemy combos is often surprisingly effective. So no worry about difficult timings compared to for example Dark Souls 2 parries where the timing required precision and anticipation of attacks. Sekiro is however not without flaws and I don't see the perfect game some people see. It sacrifices a lot for its combat mechanics and in my opinion what it gains is barely worth it. Deciding for an option does not feel too impactful and attacking bosses or mini bosses often feels a bit weak. The grappling hook is a ton of fun but sometimes is a bit wonky. The game unleashes the wrath of tutorial boxes over you and in one case even gives you bad advice. Also some interactions feel a bit unexpected to avoid the word inconsistent. Hitboxes sometimes feel insanely precise and sometimes the complete opposite of that. However, I would say the precise hitboxes are the standard and the imprecise ones the exception, not counting grab attacks, which are a problem in all Souls games and also in Sekiro. I would also also criticize the Terra mechanic as too present in the game for not really adding too much to the combat system. This game is not for everyone, but that's also true for the Souls games. In general, I would recommend Sekiro, but Souls veterans be careful. It's at many places a bit different, while the same at others. Also, they changed controls a bit, which can really mess with your muscle memory. It's not a 10 out of 10 in my book. It's still very good with some problems. I personally found the combat quite boring at many places and bosses felt too much like grinding the attack patterns into my muscle memory and perception. After that, the fights just became trivial. Soul spiced this concept up a bit with build variety, stamina management, the illusion of choice and the illusion of impactful decisions. In addition, it had multiplayer components and a better replayability. 
Still, it was time to test something new for the developers and Sekiro definitely felt different enough. I'm curious what FromSoft's next big game will be. However, I doubt that Sekiro will have the same impact that Demon's Souls once had, but it's still a game to be remembered. Thank you for watching. Well, that video got far too long, but I also had much to say about the game. It's not for me, but it's also not like I completely hated it and I see how people enjoyed it. If you liked the video, please press the like button and leave a comment. I'm always looking for feedback. And how did you like Sekiro? I usually talk about the lore of Lord of the Rings and less about games these days. If you are into that, check my in-depth lore videos and consider subscribing and pressing the infamous bell. Because my upload frequency is not that high and it increases the probability of a notification. My next video will be lore related. Again, thank you for watching and goodbye.